In today's episode, we are going to find out how six mistakes killed my very first engine build in this beautiful 2005 Lotus Elise. Why this could happen to you if you own a Lotus? And what are the lessons learned that will help us avoid a similar outcome in the future? So first thing that I found out was that my camshaft is wiped. What does it mean that it's wiped? You can see that there's a deep groove right here on this and that's bad. That's a catastrophic wear on that lifter. My expensive nickel plated engine block is in a pretty rough shape as well. You can see those deep scratches, it's called bore scoring. If I can catch my fingernails on this, then that means that my block is damaged beyond repair and I have to buy a new one. Ceramic coated Aria pistons look awful as well. I will show them to you later what they look like brand new before. The only silver lining that I found during this engine breakdown is that since I did the measuring and installation of the bearings, they actually don't look that bad. So why did I build an aftermarket engine for my Lotus to begin with? My original engine was leaking oil like Exxon Valdez and burning it to boot as well, so uh, not very happy. Uh, I also managed to score a TVS 1320 supercharger uh, for a pretty good price. That created a perfect storm, an excuse, to rebuild the engine with lower compression 9 to 1 ARIA pistons, race bearings, and all of the other race engine goodies. I sourced a nickel plated engine block, had it cleaned by the local shop, got the rods resized for the ARP bolts, yeah, I put the ARP hardware through the whole motor, had another shop uh, do the piston ring sizing since essentially the cost for a decent tool was pretty much the same as having somebody do it that they knew what they were doing, right? So, however, I assembled everything myself in this very creatively built, I must say, clean room. I think I was inspired by Dexter. So I built this clean room in my garage and um, after I put it all together, I broke in the engine using a non-synthetic oil for the first 500 miles and then switched to 5W40 AMS oil. After that, obviously I wanted to know how much power are we making, so I took the car to a wonderful performance shop here in Spokane called Advanced Auto Fabrication and we put some pretty healthy numbers down. Uh, yeah, check it out. The problem was that I had a lot of blow by. My crankcase pressure was pushing my dipstick out. Also, I had a lot of oil consumption again, so this was pretty frustrating. I thought that, you know what, maybe my piston rings somehow didn't set right, although I followed all the procedures that I was advised on, uh, you know, lots of engine braking and stuff like that, uh, to, to seal those piston rings. So anyway, but I thought, hey, maybe they just didn't sit right. So, uh, somebody advised me to use braking oil. Dump the synthetic, put, put the braking oil into the car, run it for a few hundred miles, and maybe that will help the piston rings to seal, and um, all will be good. I followed that advice, and that brings us to the first episode of the series. If you have not seen it, check it out. There will be a link right about here. So, then you'll know what happened. Now let's go over the list of mistakes that contributed to the premature engine failure and a lot of time and money wasted, wasted, wasted. One of the reasons I'm making this video is so that others can learn from my mistakes and avoid similar very frustrating problems. I think that if what I have to say is somehow informative or even entertaining, please consider subscribing and liking this video and uh, so we can help this channel grow. Here's what I think happened. 
I opted for the nickel plated aftermarket block because of uh, thermal advantages of a plating. Uh, you see the sleeved blocks, when you have an aluminum block with the iron sleeves, there's a heat expansion that happens in the different rate. Some people say that their sleeves can dislocate and that can create to all sorts of head gasket problems. So, um, yeah, so I thought, hey, let's go get fancy and let's get a nickel plated block because that's a great technology used uh, in aircraft engines. Well, the problem is that the engine that I bought was not an OEM application. Um, so I put my trust in a product with a little real world data. Uh, you know, aftermarket small outfit uh, plating the cylinder walls. So what could go wrong? I trusted someone to do the piston ring sizing because the right tool costs as much as the job itself. I had no experience um, with any of this, so I thought, okay, let's leave it up to an expert. Now, here's the problem. Um, when I got the pistons and the rings, I didn't double check the clearances. And that was a big mistake because I think something went south somewhere there and if I if I had caught that mistake uh, I probably would be still running that engine. I think that was really really big factor. I used a braking oil after the braking period uh, because I assumed that the piston rings just didn't set. What ended up happening I ended up filing those piston rings actually should show you. So check this out. So here is what the rings on this piston look like. They are insanely sharp. I mean, the edges are just, yeah. Uh, it's kind of like really, really great scissors uh, when they are brand new. That's what the edges of those piston rings are feeling. So yeah, I think I use the braking oil to sharpen my piston rings and create a gigantic gaps to boot so yeah at some point the, the blow by was just yeah pretty pretty bad i think our next problem was actually caused by lotus engineers now the challenge is that that is 17 feet of oil that has to be pumped by this oil pump right here that's an oil pump uh, 2cc was not designed to uh, pump through you know this much this much line so the suspicion is is that the oil pump is not um, efficient enough to push it all through after searching a bunch of online forums on the lotus talk seems that there's a growing consensus that Lotus, the way, especially in the 2005 year uh, of production, they put two oil coolers up front. I will show you around how this whole, is routed, the whole thing is routed. There's an oil line coming from the right side and the left side of the car. They are running all around the vehicle with the front oil coolers that sit essentially they are fed by those intakes so you cannot really see it but there a oil cooler here and there is an oil cooler on this side so the oil runs all around the car and then comes back to the engine bay those two coolers tend to overcool the oil apparently the oil reaches something like 180 degrees fahrenheit which is not enough to actually burn the impurities uh, in the oil as well as there's water moisture that gets in there which messes with the lubrication properties so kind of that is a problem when you're revving your engine pretty high and you know i revved that engine to about 8400 maybe 8500 rpm with force induction so that is a, just a recipe for disaster so i only had about 4000 miles on this motor and and that's what happened.
To compound the oil temperature problems, Lotus engineers decided that driver didn't need an oil temperature gauge. I don't know why. The engine wouldn't let you rev past 6000 RPM based on the coolant temperature. Once the coolant would reach 158 degrees, the ECU would let the driver to rev all the way to 8500 RPM. Uh, the problem is that the oil temperatures were lagging about 50 degrees behind the coolant temperatures. So without knowing that, you know, I would start having fun, uh, step on it, uh, and the oil was not hot. It was, it was a cold oil. So uh, yeah, that was definitely a recipe for disaster in my case. So now what? Here is the plan right now how to fix all of this. I got a new Toyota block uh, that I actually already took to machine shop. Why did I take it to machine shop? Well, I'm putting a new uh, low compression mallet pistons. Uh, my setup is with the 9 to 1 compression, which is lower from the stock. The stock compression on the 2ZZ motors is 11 to 1. So I need to have the pistons, uh, the, the rings for uh, rings for the pistons gapped, I, because I'm putting a ARP rod bearing bolts. When you put the new rod bearing bolts, they put so much pressure that actually you have to resize the rods for in, in order to have the proper clearances. And that's, uh, yeah, I leave that to the experts, you know. After all, I'm just a musician that is trying to play a, a auto mechanic. So yeah, once we have that back, then the very challenging thing that, I, uh, that I'll be attempting to do is uh, to replace the camshafts. And since this one is wiped, that is essentially junk at this point, um, I got a stage three camshafts from Mikey Rate Wrench Racing. Uh, and I will have to do uh, the valve clearancing. I'm not looking forward to that. Uh, again, never done this before. So this is going to be a very interesting adventure. I will take you along with. I purchased a oil cooler that is going to mount on the other side of the car. This is an intercooler for the supercharger. And on this side, we have some room to stick an oil cooler that is going to have, you know, um, five five feet of uh, oil line or so. So so it's going to be a lot less hoses that that oil has to flow through. First issue is that since the engine has a lot of deep scratches, there's probably a bunch of metal floating around through the system, oiling system, and some of that metal can get trapped in the oil coolers and there's unfortunately no really uh, affordable way to clean it out. Apparently when the oil coolers expand due to heat and there's some metal flakes uh, that get into the crevices, when they cool down, they trap it there. So when you try to just wash it out, it's not going to come out. So what do you do then? Yeah, you start the new, new build motor with all that uh, junk in your oil coolers and the things get hot all of that travels into your engine and yeah not fun then, then you would have to do it all over again which would be expensive and pain in the freaking neck so well we're not doing that we're going to get brand new oil cooler uh, mounted on the side and call it a day now what to do about all that extra weight since it's a Lotus I mean we should be weight, uh, weight saving all that extra weight of the oil coolers and their lines I mean, normally we should probably just um, remove it, which is a pain in itself, but there might be a better idea. Let me, let me show you. Oh, 